I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Who would think that a cartoonist could tell us about cancer, and especially her own, and have us feel her panic and pain while making us laugh at the same time? Marisa Acacello Marchetta does just that in her amazing graphic memoir, Cancer Vixen. And it's not only amazing, it's beautiful. Oh, thank you, Ronnie. I'm so, so happy to be here. Oh, it's, a, it, it's such a, an interconnection between your own life and who you are and right. the book and, yeah. and, and telling you the experience. What it is is it's a graphic memoir, which I hope people understand, are a series of... It's told in comic book form. Comic it's book a memoir form. told in comic book form. And, um, you know, basically, when I was writing the book, I doc and going through the treatments and everything, I documented every single thing. I took tons, thousands of photos. I uh, taped most of the doctor's interviews except for the one. very first ones, <laughs> especially the first one when I went to um, talk to Dr. Christopher Mills, who was a breast surgeon. He um, was telling me what was what was going to happen, the next steps after I was diagnosed with breast cancer. My mother was with me, and you know. In peanuts, when the teacher talks and you hear wah wah yeah, wah wah, yeah. well, that's what happened. I heard wah 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 <laughs> lymphectomy, wah 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 lymph nodes, and yeah, after that, I didn't hear anything. And I walked out of there with my mother, and I said, "Mom, did What's you understand what he said?" And she said, "Of course not, did you?" And I thought, "Okay, that was the last doctor's visit without a tape recorder, so it really came in handy." And they didn't mind. Uh, there were some doctors who did. Um, I didn't work with those doctors. Um, some hospitals don't allow it, and some doctors just feel strange or they're maybe insecure or for whatever reason, but my yeah. doctors all let me tape them. And that was one of the reasons you had them. Yeah, well, plus they were great and yeah. so compassionate right. and yeah. excellent at their So it's jobs. an important lesson number one is uh -huh. to be assertive. And really, oh, yeah. yeah. And, and to really be informed. Be informed. That's really, really important. So, But this ha started... Um, a month before you were getting married? It happened actually less than a month before I was getting married. I was 43 at the time and about to marry the man of my oh. dreams. I'd never been married before. His yeah. name is Silvano Marchetto. He owns Sta Silvano Restaurant in the West Village. And I was really happy. My career was going really well and I had actually found the shoes to my wedding dress. I didn't find the wedding dress yet <laughs> because for me, shoes, you the know, come dress. first. That's, is that because your mother was a shoe designer? Uh, that's one of the reasons, yeah. yeah. I mean, to me, shoes are like comfort food yeah. without the calories. <laughs> we have to explain also that you're what I love to refer to as a downtown girl, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which means, and you talk about what a fashionista is or what it does, but it, let's, it's so hard to decide where to start with you. You are a professional cartoonist. Yes. Right. Yes. And your cartoons appear regularly in the in, New Yorker and, and Glamour. And Glamour, Glamour, yep. And um, actually, Cancer Vixen appeared in Glamour uh, May 2005 when I was diagnosed. My editor called me and she said, it's that time of the month again, meaning, you know, I had a deadline for Glamour Girls, yeah. a panel that uh -huh. runs every month in Glamour. And she said, you know, what is going on in your life right now? And I told her I was diagnosed and she said, Oh my God, that's terrible. Can you give me four pages? <laughs> and so that's how it started. That's how it started. But your cartoons are, I mean, you're also a feminist. A big feminist, yeah. yes. And I don't mind saying the, the F good. word. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a feminist and your cartoons poke fun in a way, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. At your contemporary, at the world that you live in. Well, you know what? If you can't laugh at yourself, you know, what's then the point what's the all? point? Right. And for me, I always try and find the humor in every single situation. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, led me to the healthy diagnosis that I have today is that I try to find the humor. I worked through everything. I always had a goal and I focused on, you know, when I was about to have a lumpectomy, I try to focus on my upcoming marriage. I did get married on time. <laughs> when I was going through chemotherapy, I was focusing on writing about it, documenting it, and having a goal of a deadline. So it helped me to look past cancer and look past whatever it was I was going through. So are you saying that the cancer didn't absorb your whole life? You Is know that, what? And it's really funny. Like most of my you, friends thought I was in denial, yeah. which I wasn't. Yeah. But I was just trying to, yes, deal with having cancer. Yeah. But also, you know, not make it. To be a little detached. From yes, and not make it my whole life. I didn't yeah. want to, you know, when I was first diagnosed, the doctor, Dr. Mills, did a sonogram of the tumor. And I looked at the printout and I thought, that looks like a black hole. Yeah. And he said to me, it looks like a pearl. 
a pearl. A pearl is a symbol of hope. And beautiful. And beautiful. And I thought, well, you know, up until that point, I went to a very negative, dark space. I went to the black hole, so I tried to use this as a catalyst for me to change my life for the so better. Interesting. Yeah, so I refer to myself as me BC before cancer and me C after cancer. And there is a big difference in the way I live my life right now. It, you know, my husband died when he was very young, 42, mm -hmm. and I was 39. Yeah. Well, it, and it was a shock, you know, it was some 30 some odd years ago. Yeah. But it made me understand so much more about life. I mean, it's not, it's not the same, but it is the same. It's a, it's a sudden thing mm -hmm. that happens to you, right? Yeah, it's all of a sudden your it life just, changes as you know yeah, it. I became an enormous risk taker afterwards, or I just wanted to enjoy things. And well, you know, stuff. it's interesting. I mean, I feel yeah. the same way. And yeah. also, I was, you know, a bit of a fashionista running from this party <laughs> to this party to this it event, blah, 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 whatever. And now, I really look at my life and try to live my life in slow motion and just savor every Everything. moment. Yeah. I mean, I remember the, the first plate of spaghetti pomodoro I had with my husband the day that I was officially diagnosed, and I remember every bite. I mean, it was like yeah. the most delicious meal I've ever had, Isn't and it? I really try and do that and live that way every day. It's hard, but I try. So you not only faced this terrible illness, but you sort of embraced it, and it became part, of, and you go on, right? Oh, yeah. But the book is so filled. It's, it's A, it's filled with details, yes. and it's really a good lesson mm -hmm. for people, and it's, it's a good textbook to have if you go. I mean, I would imagine every woman thinks it could happen any time. Did you think about it before, or were you too young? No, because I was like off in my own little world. Yeah. You know, I was living like what I call the silly superficial lifestyle. <laughs> Does that have initial? An initial? Yeah. Oh wait, was it the silly superficial official stuff? The SSS. SS. <laughs> yes, that's what I was calling it. And you know, I at the time didn't have insurance. I let my insurance lapse, and yeah. that is a big problem. It's a nightmare. Because not only did I have to tell you know, my future husband that I, you know, <laughs> had breast cancer, but I had to tell him that I didn't have insurance. And but you didn't um, tell him right away. I told him the same, everything. Oh, you did? At the, yeah. Oh, you did. You know, well, okay. first I told him, you know, days before that I may be diagnosed, but uh, the pro I was afraid for my life. I didn't know how I would get treatment. And I found out something while doing all the research for the book, and that is 49% of women who have breast cancer and don't have insurance have a greater risk of dying. That's in this country. Is it, can you get into a hospital without the insurance? What do you have to do? Well, Does somebody have to guarantee it? Well, you know what? Uh, some hospitals will take you and they will put you on a payment plan or they'll you know, make some kind of arrangement. Um, I actually started a fund called the Cancer Vixen Fund at St. Vincent's Comprehensive Cancer Center for women who don't, don't have, have insurance. So and so we sponsor free mammograms, and I am committed to making that fund grow, and also to the Breast Cancer Research Foundation as well. A percentage of the proceeds of the book goes to the fund. And that's and all to a, the foundation. A, a 501c3 or whatever it's called, so it's tax deductible and all that, is it? For you know, people to contribute? Uh, I, 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 yeah, so. I imagine sure so. I set it up with, yeah. yeah but um, And people can contribute to it if they want to. Yeah, they can. Yeah. Um, I also found out when I uh, was doing some work with the Breast Cancer Research Foundation that um, the, the government cut the funding for the National Cancer Institute in 2006 by 6% at the same time that our population has escalated to 300 million people. So that means, Ronnie, right now that more people will be diagnosed with cancer because the population has it's, it's risen larger. and there'll be less money to fund a cure, not just for breast cancer, but all cancers. cancers. So that's why it's really important to support groups like the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. And do the statistics show that breast cancer incidents are higher than they used to be? It Actually, to me, you know, I've heard conflicting. Yeah, and I guess maybe it's because there's better detection, early detection. Well, I mean... I have young friends who have breast cancer. It seems like a lot of people are getting yeah. it and more and more, but it used to be one in seven, and now I hear it's one in eight. Yeah. But, you know, Evelyn Lauder says that early detection saves lives, right. so it's really important to get yeah. those mammograms. And Do you have a cartoon in here, or did I see it someplace else of different clusters? I did, actually. Yes. 
I did. Yes, that's it's, what I thought. I did the research, right. and you know what's really interesting? I think it's like page 30 or back here. I was doing research on cancer clusters. Uh-huh. Yes. And it's, so it's and not a lot of information is out there because it's not proven, but people are dying. Isn't that evidence enough? Right. It's very scary. It's involving. really scary. And then you also, I mean, this is it's such a great book because it does have the humor in it. It does talk about the world you live in. Yes. And it <laughs> also talks about this cancer and mm -hmm. the cells and mm -hmm. what happens to the cells and what they, what they even look like. Well, you know what? I mean, that... What do the doctors say about the book? Well, the doctors... Um, my doctors love the book, uh -huh. and uh, I did a reading at St. Vincent's. Oh, and, great. Yeah, and it was, there was a Q&A with them, and we took the whole process step by step. But one of the things that happened early on was Dr. Mills, when he did, he aspirated the tumor, he, which means he took a thin needle into the tumor and pulled out some cells. And he said to me, we need to see if the cells are angry. Well, I'm a cartoonist. <laughs> angry cancer cells, what could that possibly look like? So I saw the cells as little green-faced meanies giving me the finger. <laughs> and when I did that, I thought, well, you know what? It made them less threatening because it made me laugh and it made me feel like the whole thing would be easier to overcome. So the book has helped me tremendously. And, you know, I'm really grateful that it will be able to help other people as well, not just by reading it, but also through the fun. And, and St. Vincent's, is, is, are they distributing it or is it available? Well, they have it there yeah. at, at the hospital, right. and uh, I wanted to reach out to all hospitals and all breast cancer right. organizations because I want to do whatever I can, and um, that I could be reached at www.cancervixen.com. Please, you know, I want It's a great website. Yeah, yes, thank and you. And please to go to it. So when did you become a cartoonist? How did you decide to become a cartoonist? Well, it's kind of interesting. I had a cartoon. Well, first of all, my mother was a shoe designer, yeah. so she would do these trend reports, and she would draw these women with great-looking shoes, great-looking women, and she'd say, this is who they are, this is where they, you'd find them in the city. And then, you know, I started imitating her doing that when I was three, <laughs> so that's basically how, how you started drawing. it all started. Yeah. And then... Um, Did you live in the city? No. I li I'm from New Jersey. Right. And then, when I was about eight years old, um, we always used to vacation down the Jersey Shore. And um, my father had enough money to take the family on a real vacation to Bermuda. And we flew down there, and my mother didn't like the room at the resort, so she said to the resort owner, can we have something a little bit bigger, please? My mother, by the way, <laughs> is very domineering. I refer to her as mother. And I she's, know. It's, it's she's paren, really funny. S, and paren, and, and then mother. mother. Yes, mother. <laughs> Does so, she laugh at that? She does laugh at that. <laughs> so um, he put us in this uh, house on the fringe of the resort, this pink elephant of a house. And <laughs> on the walls were these drawings with captions. And I thought, oh, my gosh, this is great. The women I draw, they can talk. And it turned uh, out to be James Thurber's house. Oh, God. And the house was like a Thurber museum. I stayed up all night reading, you know, Thurber books, old New Yorkers, and... I fell asleep at like 4 o'clock in the morning, and I woke up at 7, covered head to toe with red ants. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Turns out the house was infested, uh, but I say that that's when I was officially banned so by the court. Did you ever go dog. into the bar on 44th Street, I think it was, that where Thurber had drawn all over the walls? Well, actually, that... Costello's, it call, was called. Well, you know, there were Thurber drawings all over the walls at the New Yorker. So there was oh, right. like a museum there. Yeah. yeah. And he but, used to pay his bills yeah. at Costello's by drawing. Oh, really? And it was a place where a lot of newspaper men went. When I first met Jimmy, he used to go there all the time. But oh, that's so interesting. It, the lights were always dim. Oh, because he <laughs> because didn't want the, the place drawing. was a mess. But <laughs> you could look at the Thurba cartoons. And when they closed Costello's, I, somebody bought them. I think they were very concerned about saving oh, the really? walls. But I don't know really what happened. Or maybe they're, those are the maybe drawings the that's ones, in New York. That may be what I it is. I bet that's what yeah, it is. Yeah. So you started drawing cartoons, and then mm -hmm. you went through school. I went through school, and then I went into <laughs> advertising. Yeah. And um, So that's when you started writing captions. When I started, you know, writing. I was writing and oh, drawing and advertising, yeah. and then um, I really didn't like it very much. I was, and when, I was, when I'd sit in advertising meetings, um, <laughs> everybody thought I was taking such copious notes, but I was drawing those women I had drawn <laughs> since I was three. Oh, that's so great, yeah. Yeah, and then um, when I turned 30... I was, 
I lit candles on New Year's Eve, and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And I called in every single higher spirit, God, <laughs> Jesus, Buddha, Allah, you name it, all the saints in heaven, any, anybody who I thought could help me. And um, instead of writing a list of what I wanted to do with, for the year, I started drawing that the girl, you know, the woman, one of right. the girls, with a gun in her mouth with a line. She was a little upset during the meeting. <laughs> And that's how I got back into cartooning, and I thought, oh my God, that's what I should be doing all along. I never should have left it. So I was so excited. I leaned into my sketchbook, and you know, I lit a candle, and Deeper. my hair oh. caught on fire. So <laughs> <laughs> that's how it happened. So then you started writing. Cartoon. So how do you sell a cartoon? You have to work really hard. I mean, I was lucky. That cartoon that I drew that night wound up in Mirabella and it ran, she ran in Mirabella for two years. And then from that I had tried different other, other avenues and wrote a book and another graphic novel called Just Who the Hell Is She Anyway. And then I <laughs> got into the all New about, Yorker. Are these all fashionistas? Uh, it was kind of, sort of, sort of yeah, yeah, like a one life story kind yeah. of. Yeah. Up in, you know, sort of life, life in New York. and This is all in the book, incidentally, for, yeah. the, for viewers. I mean, mm -hmm. it's not only just about cancer. It's about this. It's a love story. It started it a out as story. a love story. Absolutely. I mean, it started out, I was writing about Silvano and I. And, How did you, you know, meet Silvano? Through the restaurant? I met him through the restaurant, actually. When I was about 17, my parents used to take me there from New Jersey. And we would go to this wonderful restaurant, Da Silvano. And I remember him <laughs> as this handsome whirling dervish running around like this yeah. bundle of energy. Yes. And, uh, and so then what happened? Did you just keep going there and finally? Well, I just kept going there. And, and suddenly when, you're 40? Well, I interviewed him for an article. Oh. And um, the article didn't run. It was called What It Costs. It's actually in the book. Uh -huh. And the idea was if you want to have the best hair color, yeah, this is you who you go to, right, et cetera, yeah, et cetera, right. best yeah. makeup, whatever. Best restaurant was Da Silvano, so I interviewed him, and the story was about to run in talk in November 2001, and then September 11th happened, and it didn't run, so I went back and I said, I'm really sorry, you were so nice to me, and yeah. you know, is there anything I could do? And he said, you could do cards for me, I'm announcing. Oh, that's right. it's all in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's right. all in the book. So you did cards, and he I kept did changing cards, them? And he kept changing them, and he kept <laughs> calling me, and he kept changing them. And then, <laughs> I, s I told my friends, you know, I think I kind of have a crush on Silvano. <laughs> and they said to me, Marisa, you have such a lousy track record with men. You better not start dating Silvano because you're going to ruin that restaurant for us. <laughs> <laughs> and then one day. Huh? And then one day, yeah. yeah. That's such a lovely story. It's really it's funny. A lot of fun. What I loved is that you were always afraid as you're going through your treatments of cancer of the, all the beautiful women that are there. Oh, my gosh. I have to say, though, that, yeah, I was terrified because, you know, I didn't know what was going to happen to me. I yeah. didn't, you know, who, what would happen with my hair, what would happen with my body, whether I would even live, most importantly. So yeah. it, it, the fact that he stuck by me really validated <laughs> our relationship. And, you know, I'd say he could have gone with the woman who had the best legs, the best breasts, but instead he married somebody who <laughs> had breast cancer, whose most outstanding feature is her nose. So <laughs> it made she me also <laughs> made him laugh. Right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but you know, it made me much more secure. Yeah. You know? Well, I I left because here I am, seventy five years old, uh -huh. and I used to go to Pierre Michel mm -hmm. when it was in Trump Tower. Right. And I always felt, and 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 then I was a, an elected member of the city council, and I was, uh -huh. you know, I was a substantial person. But I felt like I was this tall compared to all these beautiful, thin, it always, it still bothers me right. when I see all these beautiful, <laughs> they, I'm not even in the realm of their lives. So I was glad to see that someone who's successful and healthy and well and married to, a, with a wonderful marriage, felt the same way. It made me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> Do we always, you don't worry about that anymore? Well, you know, it's funny. It's funny because I feel like this whole experience yeah. has brought me back to the sisterhood. I was always a yeah. feminist, yeah. but you know, going through that before cancer, I was like, "What is going on with women today?" Because yeah. they were really, you know, pretty Isn't intense. That incredible. And now it's like, you know, I just look at women, and you know, I want to help. It's really yeah. restored my faith right. in the sisterhood. So when you go to these parties, you do you still go to some parties? Yeah, of course, yeah. of course. But I don't. Do you, you know, are you um, a big mingler? I'm a big talker, in you case are. you haven't noticed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't noticed that. 
Uh, but you you feel I like meeting people. You and, do. Uh, yeah. Reaching. Yeah. Well, it's all material too. It's all isn't material. It? I mean. So you have that wonderful ability mm -hmm. that you're working all the time. Yeah, I am working all the yeah. time. Yeah. But I'm also, you know, gathering information. And do your FF friends my, forever. My BFFs. B, best friends forever. B, uh -huh. We have to explain that you abbreviate a lot. Yeah. You give people like little, little nicknames yeah, that yeah, are yeah. initials. Uh, do they mind showing up in your column, in your uh, caricature sometime? No, they all loved it. The only person who was really angry was my mother, my uh -huh. smother. Uh, at the beginning? Well, she was mad because after I finished the book and I was working 20 hours a day, seven days a week, I didn't see anybody for months. And finally, when I handled the artwork in and it was like sent to production, I saw her and went down to the house in New Jersey. My father opens the door and he says, wait till you see your mother. <laughs> and I look at her and there she is. She lost 35 pounds and she has her hand on her hips and she <laughs> says, I don't like the way you drew me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, Mom, I can't Photoshop the weight off. <laughs> but so now other than she's that, she's, uh, she loves it. She's yeah. really and happy. Then, and all the circum when you make fun of the parties or you make fun of the women at the parties or the men, mm -hmm. um, they don't mind. Well, they I, may. And that's some of them may. But, yeah, I know. think they do. I don't I'm, know. Well. Sometimes. I don't know. But you always do it with such a nice humor. So what's the actual physical thing, how you do this? Well, you do a separate drawing for each frame? Yeah, I do. I mean, I rough out each page and I uh, try and figure out exactly where I want it to go and um, first I actually did sort of like an outline and I was lucky that I was able to you know do this first in Glamour and it ran right. six so pages so yeah. yeah so I kind of had like a, yeah. a story arc and then I had all the other stuff I was taking notes you right. know about what's going on in the restaurant so I just put it all together and I had boxes and boxes and boxes of things and yeah. papers and notes and went through everything and sat down and started writing it. So do you do the actual printing? I do the actual, pr I do everything, words and pictures, and it just all comes together. And do you, how do you color it? Is it that done was, on a computer? That was done in Photoshop. The artwork is scanned, mm -hmm. and then um, the color is added in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. I actually had to have somebody help me with that because mm -hmm. while I was finishing the drawing, you know, it was like impossible for me to Right. You know, do both. I was I had to feed it. So what I would do was blow up each page, and uh -huh. have like a chart of colors from one to a hundred. And each, when oh, I was finished with it, you know, I would write the numbers out in red, and it would look like a paint by numbers <laughs> thing. And great. then the guy yeah. in Photoshop would, would fill it in. Was Jason would fill it in, and mm -hmm. uh, and then I helped so out. Is the printing it. hand printed? I hand did it yeah, by hand. It's yeah, it's all hand printed. All hand. -printed. So when you do a cartoon for the New Yorker uh -huh. or something. It's just black and white. It's black and white, and then you do a wash, and then you hand them actual art. Here, it was scanned and then put into Photoshop, and it was all electronic. Tell you in the book, you also talk about selling the, the cartoons. I, mean, I do talk about the New Yorker quite yeah, a bit. Yeah, it's so it's very interesting. So mm -hmm. tell us about it. Yes. Well, it's interesting because uh, Bob Mankoff, the cartoon editor, um, he has weekly cartoon meetings um, on Tuesdays, and they end. They start at ten, end at twelve, and we all the cartoonists wait online, and it's you know first come first seen kind of thing, <laughs> yeah. and and that's how it works. And we each have individual meetings, and he'll we give him a batch of cartoons, which consists of ten to fifteen cartoons, and he'll pull some that he thinks could work, and then he'll go off and have another meeting with David and Remick, and that's how they'll. Go through the approval, approval process, yeah. And do you, so how long does it take you to write a cartoon? How many cartoons do you have to do in a week? I do like 10 to 15 in, in a, a week. week. Yeah. And you're doing glamour at the same time, but I'm that's glamour. monthly. That's monthly. And so then I'm also working on another book, and then oh, I have great. other stuff going. Yeah. Yeah. I always like, I like to have, as a cartoonist, my friend Sam Gross, who's also in the book, he's a cartoonist, yeah. S. Gross. He says, you got to be a street rat with this right. thing. Yeah, which and means, you show the rat. <laughs> yeah, I show him as a rat. He turns into a rat as he's <laughs> right. telling me his philosophy. Yeah. you got to like find scraps of work. You've got to like create markets for yourself as a cartoonist. Uh -huh. And that's something So your that niche is? Fashion, women's issues, social commentary. Okay. And that kind of stuff. Do you have, are Food. you assured of a certain place? No. Do you pay any attention to the placement in the, in the magazine? No, you can't. You and, don't. Yeah. Do they alternate it? Or how do they decide where they're going to put a cartoon? That's, do you know? That's up to the editors. Yeah. Yeah. And they just decide. Yeah, but in Glamour, I'm in the Jews Don't section. Uh-huh. Every month. That's great. Yeah, yeah, and they're a wonderful, wonderful magazine. Right. 
And do you do you still do some stuff for the Times? I haven't done no. I haven't done um, anything for the Times in a while. Um, but you know, I'm always. And, and you get political. I mean, I not do. only do you do the mm -hmm. feminism, but you mm -hmm. get political. So you have to read a lot of newspapers and pay attention to the news. You what have do you to do? be How do you do this? current on everything. Every, I mean, yeah. you know, you never know where, um, right. what, where, what, what what's is going to spark an idea. Yeah. But um, you know, right now for me, the most political thing is a health care issue, and you know, saving yeah, lives through great. research. Yeah. Do you wake up in the morning and devote a certain amount of time to thinking? Uh, I wake up in the morning and just try and get out of bed, basically, <laughs> and stay What awake. time do you get up? Um, well, my husband gets me up at like 7.30 in the morning. But you must get to sleep late, too, because you, you're at the, are you at the restaurant every night? Mm -hmm. Oh, boy, that's quite a life. But that's a good place to see a lot of things, no, it's isn't great. it? it's yeah. great. It's great to see yeah. everything. And so you don't really devote time to just thinking. It's just a collection of it's what you thought of and, yeah, and observed. I mean, it's like, you know, I'll be working, I'll, yeah. you know, I sort of like I do a lot of different things during yeah. the day. Yeah. It's so interesting. Well, thank you. We're, we're, I mean, we're just about at the time. Oh, so I hope you, that Bonnie. people will buy this book and look at it mm -hmm. and um, also support the foundation because it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It's, um, it, thank you. it's something that's so needed and it's so good to see the combination of feminism and health and the support of community. Thank you. And I'm really, and I'm, I mean it when I say I want to reach out to other yeah. organizations and, yeah. you know. All right. And so they'll me. go to your website and they can write to you and mm -hmm. you actually look at the emails, right? I return everything and I am available to help. Great. Thank you so much, Thank Marisa. You. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.